voluntary and is for the benefit of learning from and sharing with other parents whose child has passed away. It is understood that our discussions are intended to be confidential and not designed to replace traditional therapy or spiritual counseling. Our mission is a nonprofit organization dedicated to assisting bereaved parents, giving them support and resources to aid in the healing process. We go a step beyond other groups by allowing the open discussion of spiritual experiences and evidence for the afterlife in a non-dogmatic way. Affiliate groups welcome anyone and everyone, regardless of religious or non-religious uh, background, and allow for open dialogue. The affiliate leaders on tonight are Tracy, Susie, uh, Brian, and myself, and uh, our uh, other affiliate leader, Beth, is not joined us yet, but she shall shortly. So uh, welcome, everyone, and I know we're in for a real treat with Sandra. Thanks. Shall I begin? Yes. Oh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, first of all, to Helping Parents Heal for allowing me to be your guest today. And from wherever you are, whether you're watching this live or you're watching the replay, just know I'm going to give you everything I've got in this hour, hour and a half to answer questions, to give you my story. Um, and yeah, just to tell you where I'm at with this whole world of the afterlife. So a little bit about me. My name is Sandra Champlain. I'm coming to you from a little town called Byfield, Massachusetts. Just had a little snow today, which is great. I am the author of this book, which you can see showing off a little bit. It's called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death, which I published just four years ago. Uh, I have a day job. I'm a chef. I travel with my mom. We own a catering company and we serve race car drivers and race teams around the country. So it's hard work, but I get to spend a lot of time with my mom. So um, first, let me just say, you know, we're doing this right now around the holiday times and whether you're watching it now prior to Christmas or after, uh, I know there's one thing that brings us all together and that is having a loved one no longer walking planet Earth with us. We call it transition, we try, call it um, across the veil, call it them being in the afterlife. So to whomever is no longer walking by your side right now, I offer you my love, my compassion. Um, no matter what we believe in the afterlife, I do beyond a shadow of a doubt believe that there's no pain worse than the pain of grief. So I do know for myself that having a belief in the afterlife and then having um, even better than that is a group of people such as helping parents heal that we can turn to and be involved with. It really helps. It really helps our journey being a human. So let me just tell you a little bit about my story. You know, I never thought I'd be somebody who would be talking about the afterlife. Not me, not in a thousand years. Uh, my subtitle of my book is A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And in truth, years ago, I was not only a skeptic, but I was kind of an angry, miserable, uh, make fun of people who believed in this kind of stuff person. In fact, I remember going to Barnes & Noble or Borders Books when Borders were around, and I'd be walking through those, um, you know, the metaphysical New Age sections, and I'd see people picking up books on mediumship and angels and I just like I you know my ego kicked in and um, thought oh these poor people they only knew the truth there's no proof of any of that kind of stuff so don't get involved in it anyways that was me and speaking of ego I think it's important um, to identify that we all have this inner critic that um, talks in our voice that's in our head I call it the voice some people call it the inner critic, some people call it even negative Nancy. And if there's a Nancy watching, I'm sorry I used your name, but that's what people call it sometime. And you know what it is, you know, when we wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and, you know, my inner voice is always saying, you know, I'm too overweight or I'm 51 years old now and I'm still single. You know, I, I'm never gonna find a husband, I'm a loser. You know, all these self-defeating thoughts can come through our mind. And although it's not telling the truth, um, I think we all have it. You know, it's that voice that tells us that we should have done something a different way. We should have said something. It's that voice of guilt. And, you know, it's a, 
we should never be in our own heads by ourselves because it's not a good place to be. And why I bring this up is I think that's the voice of skepticism. You know, we see some wonderful things that happen in our life and our, that voice always looks to see what's undone, you know, or where we're not good enough as opposed to the successes we've had. So I think, I know for myself as an afterlife explorer, you know, the little voice in my head was always, you know, you have to see it to believe it. And my dad was an airline pilot. And, you know, I think we believe a lot what our parents say. And one of the things was if we can't see it or touch it or smell it or taste it or feel it, you know, it's, it's not real. So I think I probably just adopted that kind of a, a thought. But back in 1996, I actually woke up with this fear of dying. And I wasn't sick. And I didn't have anybody close to me that had just passed away. But it was one of these crazy, unstoppable fears. And I think uh, many times as adults or even young people, we can look up at the stars and think of the vastness of the universe and think, well, who am I? And what is my life for? And my voice in my head was just thinking, is there any proof that I go on after this life? And for whatever reason, it, it just came to me as just an incredible fear. And I was there when I woke up in the morning. It was there, you know, just before I went to bed at night. And my mom speculates that I had worked in a nursing home when I was 14. And I worked in the kitchen. That was my beginning days of my culinary roots. But the residents of the nursing home, after feeding them or bringing them their trays during the day, I would go sit with them in the afternoon after my shift, and I would hold their hands and listen to their stories. And then um, more often than not, you know, I'd find out that so-and-so has just passed away. So perhaps that was something that was in the back of my mind. I don't know. Uh, but no matter what happened, I, I just started having this incredible fear of dying. And I was raised Roman Catholic, we went to church every Sunday, and I repeated all the prayers, even though I didn't know what I was saying, but I was a good Catholic girl. And just being Catholic did not solve these fears. They didn't cause them to go away by any means. And so very secretly, I began this journey into what I call um, discovering any proof of the afterlife. And I certainly didn't tell anybody I was on it because, again, Anybody who would talk about angels or mysticism or mediums, I would think they were lunatics. So I didn't tell anybody. But I first started off with my, uh, just an exploration into religion. And I studied probably most of the major world religions. And I found out that, well, gosh, everybody believes in the afterlife, you know? So it's a common thread throughout religions. But there was nothing that I read that could give me any evidence that the afterlife was real and it didn't rest my fears. So um, not wanting to do this, I thought I really have to delve into this world of the mysticism and see if anybody in that realm has any evidence of the afterlife. And a girlfriend and I went to see a medium do a stage show. And I went for her, right? That's what I thought. You know, she wanted to go, but I thought, oh, this is going to be crazy, and they're going to try to sell me something. And, um, you know, I, I really did think it would be a, a con artist of some sort. But what I witnessed was something other than that. I witnessed a woman who gave some really great information about the afterlife and where our loved ones are and how to get in touch with them. But then also somebody would ask a question, and she He'd point to them in the audience and say, oh, your grandmother Rose is with you, and she made that delicious um, chicken noodle soup that you love so much, and she taught you how to quilt, and this is her message to you. And people would just cry with these messages because they were so specific. And I always had it that mediums did these cold readings, and, and that um, – it would be a generic message, you know, your son is with you and he says uh, he loves you, you know, something vague. So I, I was intrigued enough that I wanted to know more. And I ended up taking a weekend course on mediumship. And uh, something I have for you guys that I'm going to do is a slideshow about my top 10 reasons I believe in the afterlife. But I'll do that a little bit later. But I want to share the, the biggest thing that happened to me that I said, you know what, this is real. And so um, picture, this was back in 2002, I think, I was out um, in a conference center out in California. And there I was, 
with about 15 people that were wearing to me kind of like gypsy clothes. They had the long gowns on and they, they looked like what you would have pictured these metaphysical folks uh, to be. And I felt out of place. But the leader of the group said, uh, she explained what mediumship is. She explained that all human beings are divine souls and we're here having a human experience. And we all have the capacity to tap into the hereafter, to communicate with our loved ones, to even um, you know, get messages from them. But she says for some people, it's easier than others. And she says, just like playing the piano. If you want to learn how to be a pianist, you know, certainly there's people that are natural, but there's also people that can study real hard and practice and they can be just as good. So she says mediumship is the same way. Um, like I said, we're all divine souls having this human experience. And so she told us that we, over the course of the weekend, we were going to actually um, be mediums and, and try our hand at it, but she wanted to explain how it was done. So for the purpose of explanation, she says, everybody grab a partner. So I asked this woman, I said, oh, be my partner. And she sat knee to knee with me. And the instructor said, I'd like you to hold hands. And she says, and I'd like one of you to go first. And you're not really going to do a medium reading. You're just going to, I'm going to talk you through how we're going to do it later when we actually try. So because there was no pressure and she says, we're just going to make somebody up. She says, I want you to imagine that there's this, uh, this energy field surrounding the two of you, you know, and you can picture glistening white light or something very safe. And she says, I, your loved ones are the same personality they had before. So you need to have respect. You need to silently introduce yourself and say, I want to give a reading for my partner. And she says, what I want you to do is imagine your hearts connecting. Just, you know, this invisible energy going between your hearts. And then she says, whoever goes first, she says, I want you to close your eyes. And she says, I want you to imagine that somebody is stepping behind your partner and all you need to do is tell your partner the story of who they are and maybe what they died from, what they did for a living, or if there's any messages. But she says, because we're just practicing here, she says, literally, I just want you to make somebody up. So if you can imagine, I'm sitting, kind of you're looking at me like my partner was, I had my eyes closed. And so I just invented that there was a man standing behind her. And I said, okay, um, I'm seeing a man standing behind you. I said, um, he's your grandfather on your mother's side, just made it up. I said, his name was Jan. He was a fisherman in Denmark. And I said, I don't know why I said Denmark, but it just came into my mind. Um, I said, he's got a big gap between his front teeth. He's got blonde hair, really windburned skin, blue eyes. And I said, and I'm seeing him puffing on a cigarette. And I thought, oh, he died of lung cancer. And I said, he never told your mother that he loved her before he passed away. And so I opened my eyes. I'm like, okay, it's your turn. But what happened was this woman, total stranger, there were just tears running through, running down her cheeks. And then she told me, she says, my grandfather's name was Jan. He was a fisherman in Denmark. He fit your description. He died of lung cancer. And she said, I always heard stories from my mom that he was this rough father that never said, I love you. So it still gives me goosebumps to this day to tell that story because I thought it was my imagination. And then she turned to me using the power of her imagination. And she told me about my grandfather named John who had a cane who uh, showed me what his work uni uniform looked like and that he was standing with a big German shepherd. And that was my grandfather's dog. His name was Champa. And she said, he's one of my guides and he's always with me, even though he passed away when I was younger. But I have to tell you that that initial incident um, cracked the door open on my mind. And this negative voice that really had me say, you know, I'm taking this course in California to prove that this isn't possible. You know, it really set that voice in the back seat for a little while. And I wish I could tell you that that weekend proved that I was doing one medium reading after another, but I, it didn't work that way. Um, 
when I was trying, I think uh, I was nervous and I was trying to make it happen and there was no free flow of information, so it didn't work. And then there were moments when I really didn't care because I knew I was going to get it wrong and that's when I got it right. So although I never went on to be a medium, throughout the course of the last 15, almost 20 years, well, actually 20 years now, uh, there's been times that I've taken courses and I've dabbled in it and sometimes I've got it and sometimes I don't. Uh, but you know, it's, it's there. And I think if we all were put under these circumstances that we, we could do it. So from there, um, I, I did a course on electronic voice phenomena, which was phenomenal. I had taken a weekend retreat and it was all about electronic voice phenomena. And I tell you, at that point, I had studied enough different things, a little bit about reincarnation and about um, past life regression and out of body experiences and near death experiences and different things to really believe that the afterlife is real. But, and I wanted to tell people I did, but I still thought, gosh, if anybody knew if I was, that I was into this, they're going to think I'm a lunatic and I'd lose my friends and I'd lose my family. So I kept my mouth shut, but I attended this course on electronic voice phenomena with Tom and Lisa Butler. And I just, you know, over the course of the weekend, we had a digital tape recorder and we would record the sound of white noise. So uh, we like, there was a lot of rain that weekend in the retreat center. So we were recording the sound of rain. And I remember that um, there were a lot of examples that were played of what EVP sound like, but I was frustrated that I didn't get any myself. And the instructors could hear messages on my Tape recordings, though, they could say, oh, they said, Sandra, your mother's name is Marion. You've got a grandfather named John. And I'm thinking, how can you hear this? And I know we talked a little bit um, just before we started recording this, but EVPs can be very hard to hear because I think our brain is trained to listen and hear the background sounds. And it's, I think, much like if you go to a foreign country. I don't speak French. So if I went to France, everything would just sound like, noise to me. But then if I hear the one American saying something or, you know, British person that speaks English, like my ears would tune in and pick that up. Well, EVPs is the same way. I think our, our ears are trying to pick up the background sounds and it really takes something to listen in. Uh, and I think it takes something for our loved ones to put the voices on there too that are loud, but it just definitely takes practice. But on that night, it was a Saturday night just before the class ended. Our homework was to go to our rooms and try to get an EVP, electronic voice phenomena. So if you can imagine me, there I was alone in a cabin in the woods, very safe place, the Omega Center in Rhinebeck, New York, but it was pouring rain and I had my digital tape recorder. And at this point, I really felt like I was, I don't know if it's destined, but I knew I had some good information and I knew there's a lot of people with grief and I thought, you know, if I'm going to share this, I need to have something better than just what comes out of my imagination. Because I was petrified. If I told anybody about that medium course, the first thing they'd say is, who do you see around me? And I'd be wrong. So I, I kept my mouth shut. But with this tape recorder, you know, I'm holding it in my hands. And I said, okay. Uh, and I imagined my grandmother, my grandfather, my aunt and my uncle at the foot of my bed. And I said, if you guys are really here, and I'm supposed to help people believe in the afterlife. I said, I need you to talk loud, and then I'll say good night. Now, honestly, did I think I'm talking to myself? Absolutely, I did. But when I, I let it record for just about a minute, and then I said, okay, good night to my recorder. And here's what happened. I plugged my headphones into the tape recorder, and I just listened. And I still remember when the second marker hit on the recorder, number 46, I got just this goosebumps filled my whole system. And I'm thinking, that was a voice. And I stopped, replayed it again and again and again. And what it said was, in a man's voice, good night, Sandra. And then two women's voices said, good night. Good night. And then there was a man's voice saying, Good night, <laughs> like that. 
it clearly I could hear a difference between men and women. It sounded kind of computery, like a computer voice, but it was a voice. There were voices without a doubt. And that night, I want to tell you I was excited, but I was actually kind of freaked out because I really wanted the afterlife to be real and I really wanted to sign. But then I started thinking, you know, is there any privacy or people around me 24 seven, you know, I mean, it might sound silly. And in fact, somebody actually wrote a book called do dead people watch me in the shower. <laughs> and I think that's a really funny title, but it's, it's something we think about. And uh, the answer to that is no, I think in the afterlife, people are doing better things. Um, but in a moment's notice, or if there's a moment of grief, they can certainly be there by your side. But we do have our privacy. So anyways, after that, I brought my recording into class. And the group of the people that were there with me, although they didn't get any EVPs themselves, suddenly what happened hearing mine was this real sense of peace. And, um, and peace is the word that they, even though I got the message, like their loved ones were still around too. So I saw the power uh, on grieving people of what my information um, did for them. Now, this was a long time ago, and my book didn't come out till four years ago, so what the heck did Sandra do when she had all this information for so long? Well, I actually, that little voice inside my mind convinced me that uh, I was too busy with my day job to tell anybody about this, uh, that certainly nobody would believe me. I started having questions if I even believed myself. Um, you, you might have had some experiences, too, that were really seemed too good to be true and they were really powerful but then our minds do this thing that you know something can be the biggest deal in the world and then a couple days later it's no big deal it's no big deal you know and it's crazy how that that's part of our human design um but it, it was real and it convinced me that i was too busy doing everything else and very conveniently i put down the tape recorder uh i, I stopped sharing i i wasn't involved with people that were interested in this so it was very easy to get back into um what i thought was important you know cooking for people right crazy so Along this time, though, I'd sit next to somebody on the airplane who had just had a loved one pass away, you know, and I get this, these little nudges that, like, I knew something and that I really should share it. But it wasn't until my own father was diagnosed with cancer back in 2010, and uh, five months later, he took his last breath that I finally decided to open up about this. And just in short, what had happened was my dad, just a great guy. He was somebody who passed away at the age of 74, but he, even up to that time, he was somebody who bicycled 20 miles a day. He was real fit. He had had cancer 30 years before that. And he's one of those proven miracles. He worked with um, Dr. Bernie Siegel and he did the whole mind over matter kind of thing. And he imagined the character of Pac-Man going through his body, eating all the cancer cells. And lo and behold, dad went from a three month uh, diagnosis to suddenly having another 30 years. So dad, just a great man who uh, helped a lot of people um, do visual imagery. And he did really a lot for mankind. So when dad got diagnosed, uh, it was that this cancer um, actually broke apart um, the tumor part of his spine. And so we had to wear this turtle shell um, thing. And so he could no longer bicycle and he could, he had to move around with a walker. And, and that really, he's just started deteriorating from that point forward. He had a pain pump installed in him. It was in tremendous amount of pain. And before he passed, something totally unexpected happened. Um, my loving siblings and I started fighting and it was, fighting about stupid stuff. And uh, then the stupid stuff actually became big stuff. Dad lived in Florida and um, had a real big community of people there and wanted to stay there and he had a girlfriend there. And um, during one of my race weeks, my siblings actually moved him from Florida to where they lived in Connecticut, saying dad wanted to move and dad's calling me that he didn't want to move. And so these all, all these fights happened. and. Um, it was really a scary time because I knew dad was doing very poorly. And then I had my siblings telling me 
things like I wanted him to stay in Florida because I wanted more of his money, you know, stuff like that. And it just it, maybe, you know, you know of people or it's happened in your own family too, that these fine family dynamics just seem to crumble when a, when a loved one is diagnosed or um, they pass away. But anyways, that's what happened in my family. And even when dad took his last uh, few breaths, you know, at that point, um, my siblings and I were all together. He, he was moved to Connecticut and uh, he was hooked up to pain pumps and he was in an extremely uh, huge amount of pain. He couldn't speak and it was um, a, a unbelievable suffering that I, I witnessed. And uh, even to this day, um, I have had one sister that now speaks with me, but I still have a brother and sister who haven't spoken to me in seven years. And just because I wrote the book, I feel a little bit embarrassed that like I should be able to pull my life together and I should be able to have these relationships work. Um, but the good news is out of all of this, and I, I do have faith actually that this, that we're all kind of uh, set up on this mission. And because without my siblings behaving how they did, without me behaving how I did, without my dad going in just the style he went. I would not go to do the research on grief that I did. And then I would have never finally come out with the information I have about the afterlife. And basically, uh, I hit an all time low depression after my dad died. In those last five months with him, I was the only single kid, everybody else married. So I got to spend a lot of time with my dad. And I do believe. Uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that the more we love, the stronger the connection, and ultimately the the harder it is, and the more pain we experience during grief. And so, uh, I I was like rock bottom. Um, I wasn't contemplating suicide, but I do know that I suddenly felt this compassion for people who have lost a loved one, and I know who I'm speaking to now is lost children. And I think from everything I've heard, that is the number one hardest um, death to grieve is, is your child. So, um, you know, my heart is with you, obviously, totally. But to experience where I was, I thought, you know, people that choose to check out of life and end their own life, I can get it. Because I I couldn't see that my relationships with my siblings would ever get better, um, and they were not. They're also not talking to my mother, and not only not talking to me, but the emails that I got were so like against my character. Like I'm not this person that's about money, you know. I, I loved Dad, and that's why I behaved the way I did. But when I started researching grief, I thought. You know, there's got to be a reason that it hurts so bad. And there's got to be stuff that we can do to make ourselves feel better. There has to be a reason for grief. And so, although I found Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages, um, well, stages for dying, but there are also stages for grieving. You know, you go through the different stages. Um, and finally, there's acceptance, right? Which I don't think there really is acceptance. But you go through, um, you know, doubt and bargaining and there's anger and uh, you know there's even more stages within stages of guilt and questioning yourself and it's not even just anger it's rage and, and then the uncontrollable crying and just the physical pain associated with it but the more I dug the that something I found in multiple sources was that our brain chemistry actually changes when we grieve and like I'm thinking what what does that mean and the best way I can explain this, and, you know, I'm not the best, but I'd like to um, talk with some pictures, is that if you imagine we are automobiles, right? Automobiles need different fluids and able to run. So we need gasoline and engine oil and transmission fluid and brake fluid and all that stuff. Well, our bodies are run by things called neurotransmitters. And these neuro neurotransmitters, help us with all kinds of functioning like, like they regulate our mood they regulate our sleep cycles um, and so many more things and so I found out that grief is 
Here, here's another picture I'm going to paint. Um, if you can imagine someone who is addicted to, say, a pain medication or, you know, some kind of a, um, you know, one of those kind of drugs and like really addicted. And we've seen it in the movies. You might have even seen somebody in your life who goes through the withdrawal phase and you can picture it, right? You can picture that um, they're not themselves at all. Like their body is screaming for this medication or whatever the, their fix is of this, this substance. And, you know, would we ever think that somebody who is uh, going through withdrawal has all their wits about them? Would we ever trust everything they say is the truth? Uh, probably not. So even though I'm, I'm going to describe this, that when we love someone, there's actually a chemical connection that happens in our system. And so it's like the drug, sort of, that when we have love and we have that person, like everything's connected. And so when they're separated, meaning one person leaves this planet Earth, we're left here and our bodies go through this shock. And, and so there's not enough, there's no, there's no love coming back from their side. Like you're not, as far as the brain goes, I mean, I know love never dies and they're still around, but as far as our bodies go, our bodies actually have to go through this process. There's no easy way. There's no on or off switch, but our bodies are screaming for that. And so the healthy neurotransmitters that were once 100% in a fully regulating body might be down to 20%, 10%, even lower. And what happens is all those impacts of grief, the anger, the rage, the guilt, the thoughts that go through your mind a thousand miles an hour, the what ifs and I should haves. And then next thing you know, you think you hear their voices or you think you see them. Or then we go through this disbelief that that didn't really happen or we're numb. And I know, you know, I'm speaking to the choir here because we've all gone, to, gone through some really horrendous grief. But what's happened is we don't have enough of these healthy brain, or these healthy chemicals, these healthy neurotransmitters growing through our bodies. And it takes time for our bodies to replenish them. And it is difficult because the longer we kind of stew in grief um, and we can't help it, but it, it just takes a while. So, oh, you know, there's definitely things we can do to help ease the process. You know, one is what we're doing right here is we're part of a group and you're able to talk to people. You're able to hear other people's stories. And even when we can serve another person and even listen to them, I mean, that helps both of us in, in, the, um, in the grieving healing process, but to do things that um, bring you joy. And yeah, is it hard to feel joy when you're grieving? Yes, but maybe even for a few minutes to get out in the sunshine, go for a walk, get some exercise, uh, listen to some music, and just for even a few minutes, like I said, to get your mind off it can really help. My girlfriend Nancy um, was around town when my dad passed away, and she brought me to a place that was filled with puppies that you can pick up and pet. And I have to tell you, the last thing I wanted to do was to touch a puppy. I mean, I was like, because my siblings didn't let me see him right after he passed away. And it was uh, actually, I mean, we were together when he passed away, but then the rest of it just fell apart and it was hard. But anyways, bottom line is I've got all these puppies crawling all over me, licking my face. I had to laugh and I had to feel love and I had to feel joy. So all of that, even for just a couple of seconds, does help raise the... Um, these neurotransmitters back in the system. And, you know, we need to cry, um, as we know, you know, and I found out too that the chemical makeup of our tears when we're grieving is actually a different chemical makeup than our normal tears. So that was just another thing that told me that grief is something to be respected here. This is not something where somebody says, okay, you've had a month off work, time to get back. No. Um, and it's going to last as long as it's going to last. And for some people, it's many years. But I do think, and, uh, and I do write about this in my book, and I have a very healing free audio called How to Survive Grief, and I'm going to give you all a copy of two, um, that there's things that we can really do to get back on track.
So why this is all important is that I created this free audio with everything I learned about grief. And you can get it at my website, either website, Brian listed, but We Don't Die Radio is my uh, home base these days because I, I do interview people about life after death and how to live a good life. But I created this free audio, How to Survive Grief, just on what I learned. And I posted it on Facebook. Now, back in those days, I had maybe 100 Facebook friends. Now I think I'm up at the max, 5,000. But with just 100 people, something really strange happened. Is people started recommending that grief audio. 70, 70 minutes, so it was quite lengthy. But people started writing me that said, I got a copy of your grief audio. And not only did it help me understand my feelings, but several people wrote me that they chose not to commit suicide because of the words that were on it. Even somebody looked me straight in the eye way back when and said, you know, it was like you knew exactly what was in my head. And that told me that I must be grieving that this is not my fault. And it helped me get back on with my life. And I think that's just it about grief. I mean, most of us are pretty regular people and, you know, we've not experienced really hard times. And, and then we can, we can hit rock bottom with grief and really think it's us, but it's not. It's an unhealthy brain that doesn't have enough neurotransmitters. And for some people, yes, you know, maybe seeing a doctor and getting some medication is in order. Um, however, you can get help most definitely do everything we can to raise these these levels of neurotransmitters but when i got enough of these responses in fact over 3000 people had heard that grief audio within 3 months of dad's departure and that's when it hit me that like i have a moral responsibility here you know it's one thing to be embarrassed to tell people about my afterlife journey but now we're talking about actually helping people live their lives. And so I, I did what I had to do. I thought I need to get this information out. And I didn't want to have a uh, grief book because between you and me, I don't think people are looking for that. Some people are for sure. But I think I kept thinking, you know, how do I get this information into people's hands who aren't even looking for it? And, you know, I had that whisper probably my dad in my ear from beyond saying sandra if you tell people the life after death stuff title your book we don't die which is right in your face right a lot of people get kind of ticked off when they read that title but it might have people pick it up and so in my book it is my journey of why i believe in the afterlife up till four years ago because obviously i have so much more information with the radio show but chapter 10 is that chapter, how to survive grief. And then the rest of it is if we don't die, then what the heck is our life for? Why are we here on planet Earth and how to really get our money's worth out of being here? What I think our life is about. So that's a little bit about what happened. And then as miracles happen, you know, I went to a weekend course about how to write a book. And I had the courage to tell this man what I really want to write about. Come to find out he was a publisher. And he asked, you know, have you ever written? And I said, no. <laughs> and uh, he says, just write it like you're talking to me. And so I wrote to him what would be my most important chapters. And, you know, he called me and said, how soon can you have the whole book written? So I, I think I am divinely guided on my path here. I think I really um, like it or not, which I do like it. I'm, I'm being fully supported and people like, you guys with helping parents heal and the afterlife research and education institute has had me be a speaker at their annual symposium and honestly i just say yes to anybody who asks because if this story can make a difference with one person it certainly can make a difference with more because i've said it again before and i'll say it again grief is the most painful thing but i know beyond a shadow of a doubt as i look at you right now or as i look at my uh, computer right now the camera that life after death is real your loved ones who may not be by your side physically are invisibly right by your side they love you they're working to give you signs uh, they might not have perfected how to do it yet but they are your cheerleaders cheering you on for this life because your life matters. I do believe that life is an education for the soul. 
the um, hardest things that we have to deal with are the things that give us the most soul growth. I think grief has the power to actually transform us and get us on our spiritual journeys. And uh, I'm looking at time, it goes by really fast. So what I'd like to do now, if it's okay with our moderators, is show you my slideshow. Okay, it's uh, Sandra's 10 reasons to believe in the afterlife. Okay, you ready? Okay, I'm seeing heads nod, very good. Okay, so now this is new technology for me. But we're gonna see if I can get this to work. I know I can. Okay, here we go, share screen. And here we go, share screen. And then I'm gonna press play. Can you guys see that? Hallelujah. We're good, we can see it. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so this is my top 10 reasons to believe in the afterlife. And I'm gonna do this pretty lighthearted because <sighs> it was heavy for this first time and it's Christmas and it's gift giving. So number 10, and I just want to tell you, these aren't exactly in order of what I think is the worst to the best. These are all great, but it just is kind of like my journey of what I've done and where I'm at right now. And what the ones near one and two are the things that I'm really discovering right now. And uh, so number 10, I have evidential mediums, and you'll see Suzanne Wilson there and James Van Prague and, well, you know, the other, you may or may not, but um, evidential mediums are the people we go to, and we would like to hear from them that they're talking to our loved ones, and we'd like to get accurate information about what our loved ones are doing and signs that they're still around us. And, and evidential mediums are great if you've got a good one. Now, my mother tells something very funny. She says, Sandra, what do you call the guy that graduated bottom of his graduating class in medical school? And the correct answer is doctor. So why I think this is important is there's a lot of people out there with the name medium and they are not so great, you know, and they can do these cold readings and not give you the information. And uh, my recommendation is to talk like you, like when you go to a restaurant, you know, you, you find somebody that has been before that you really trust and you find out who's a good one. So I've interviewed a lot and I think probably within helping parents heal, we know of some good mediums. Um, uh, down at the bottom, I wrote the Arthur Finley College. If you're somebody who's interested in mediumship, you can actually travel to the UK and take a course on mediumship. Some of the best of the best mediums of the world have been there. And even if, I mean, I've been there as a beginner and there's a class for everybody. And I tell you, when you're with a group of people all discovering mediumships, you're getting one right after another readings of your loved ones who are around. And then up at the very top is the snui.org. And I really recommend that to people because it's the Spiritualist National Union and it's run by the folks that are behind the Arthur Finley College, but it's about 28 US dollars a year to be a member and they do it's not a zoom meeting but they have an online meet they have online meetings every week but they have online church services and the spiritualists uh beautiful um, um i went blank for a minute but um beautiful like ceremonies and church services but at the end of each one the minister who's led the online meeting we'll do medium readings on the people that are in the conference room and anytime i go there's about 15 to 20 people there's not many people that attend these so my dad's come through on readings and my grandmother that i've never met i mean with specifics so they have three or four different um church services every week plus there's classes that you can take that can you know you learn about mediumship and, and so the hereafter and things but all for that 28 dollars a year so it doesn't have to be expensive to get evidential mediumship readings okay so number 10 i have deathbed visitations <clears throat> and we hear about this we hear about people that take their last breath and they look over someone's shoulder and you know very often they can t see their loved ones coming for them or angels in fact steve jobs i have his picture uh when he passed away his last words and I was looking over I think it was his sister's shoulder and he just said oh wow oh wow oh wow even my great uncle his last few words is like it's so beautiful there and I know of a man also that uh, he was in a coma for months before he died 
And he looked out and he was able to see his loved ones who had actually died while he was in a coma. So no one had told him that they passed away and he could see them. Uh, and he came out of that coma and, and looked up his last few breaths he saw into heaven. And so it doesn't happen with everybody, but that sure is a good sign that the afterlife is real. Don't you think? So number eight is induced after death communication and grief reattachment therapy. There are actually people like I have listed here, Dr. Alan Botkin and Rochelle Wright that have worked with um, something um, it started with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but there's something called EMDR, which is this eye movement, desensitization, reprocessing, something like that. <clears throat> and it was originally founded for people who had come back from the war who, to try to dislodge a memory of you know, this post-traumatic stress disorder with the emotion. So they had found out that doing these left-right eye movements, somebody would be watching, you know, obviously it's a trained professional in this, but uh, somehow it would dislodge the memory with the, um, the, like the experience of the pain and suffering. And so Dr. Alan Botkin over on your left, he found that one too many of these left-right eye movements actually um, put somebody in a different altered state that not only were they able to see their own deceased loved ones, but one of them actually uh, clearly identified people in Dr. Alan Botkin's life, and he didn't even believe in the afterlife and wasn't even into this. So um, really fantastic. And so now there are actually people all over the world, whether it's with IADC, induced after death um, communication, or the grief reattachment therapy. I interviewed both of them for my show. Uh, and Dr. Uh, Rochelle Wright, um, she spoke at the last symposium and really great stories, but it's so interesting because it's something like over, I can't remember, but it was like over a 90% success rate that to put you in that state that you can connect. And, and it, um, it's fantastic. And why I included Craig Hogan here is he's the president and the founder of the app of the um, AREI, After Life Research and, Insti and Education Institute. And he actually has a self-guided um, thing that you can listen to to help you reconnect with your loved ones. And I've got one of those too, which I'll get to in just a minute. Another free gift. So number seven, I have reincarnation. And people are on the fence about reincarnation, but I actually like it because I thought, you know, if I was God, uh, why would I just give someone a couple of months on planet Earth? You know, I'd recycle them. I'd let them come back. And Every time we go in, we can learn something new. And, you know, you hear about old souls. And maybe we have more opportunities to learn each time we come back. And so on top, um, if you do a little Google search on James uh, Leiniger, he's got, his parents got a book called Soul Survivor. He actually, as a young boy, remembered with so much clarity who he was, uh, where he crashed, um, in the Hawaii. Hawaiian waters, I can't remember the whole story, but with so much accuracy of events that actually occurred. And he actually said that he had a sister named Anne. Uh, his name in his past life was James and gave the name of his brother and sister were actually the names of Jane Houston, who is in this picture here, um, of his siblings. And there he is on the right, he actually got to meet his sister Anne, um, that was his sister in a previous uh, incarnation. And then on the bottom, um, Susan Messino was a great guest that I interviewed, and as a, a, her son, when he was a young boy, he kept uh, having dreams, and his mother would find him out of bed, that he was on the ship, and he says, it's going down, it's going down, and, uh, and really unbelievably terrible nightmares. And so as a young boy, he started drawing all these ship pictures. Now, if you look at the picture of the ship, and then you look at the picture of the Titanic, um, eh, they're pretty similar. And if you can see, too, and, and she said in every drawing, there's only three smokestacks that would have smoke coming out of them. And this boy said he was an engineer, that he helped di design this ship. And she says, well, how come there was only smoke coming out of the three smokestacks? And he says, well, Mama, we designed it that way because it had to look good and had to look balanced. Well, folks, sure. <laughs> As the nose on your face, the Titanic only had smoke coming out of three smokestacks, and one was a dummy stack. So really great. And some people, um, 
even though they want to believe in reincarnation, some people chalk it up to maybe it was uh, the loved one and the kid was a medium and the loved one was coming to them. I don't know, but I, I, I go for reincarnation and I think they're phenomenal stories. The next one is electronic voice phenomena and uh, there's a picture of a tape recorder on the top right and there's Tom and Lisa Butler who wrote the book, There Is No Death and There Are No Dead. They're the people that I studied with and their website is pretty awesome for not only teaching but great examples of um, electronic voice phenomena and their website is atransc.org. And I know our fine friends at Helping Parents Heal are recording this so you don't have to write all this down. You can actually go back and watch the replay. So you don't have to write it all down now, but if you want to, that's okay too. And I think you're aware of our friend, Dr. Sherry Pearl, who actually has been teaching parents and people how to connect with their loved ones through the veil. And she's got a great informational, instructional YouTube video and if you're on YouTube, you can just type in Sherry space EVP space VID. Okay. So I'm actually going through these pretty quick because I want to leave time for our questions and answers. The number five reason Sandra believes in the afterlife is visual, instrumental, trans communication. Now, Sonia Rinaldi is somebody who spoke at the symposium. She's very big into electronic voice phenomena, but I am including here her um, visual pictures are just a couple of them or three of them anyways and Sonia is someone and most of the people I'm presenting here have pretty much given this information away they're not people that you see for you know a thousand dollars for ten minutes these are people generously giving their time in fact I asked Sonia how much she charges when a parent comes to them and she says I've never charged it's all free and some people do give donations so I think that's so cool and that really shows me something. The top left, let me just go on to Mark Macy for a second. Remember when I told you about that um, course on the EVP? Well, one of the ladies I'd taken that course with also went to another seminar with me that this Mark Macy spoke at. And he had what really was a Polaroid camera, but he had some other kind of contraption around it. And what this contraption did somehow is it, along with the camera, is it would make two faces out of one in a Polaroid shot. And so, you know, I wasn't too sure about this. And even looking at this lady's pictures, yeah, it looks like there's two different people. But he showed different pictures of, uh, he would take like a picture of me. And then if I was lucky enough, I would see a picture of my loved one that would come out of it. Well, that didn't happen. I watched my Polaroid picture develop and there was just me. But the woman who was next to me uh, was an African-American woman with a very slender face. And her daughter had gone off a building to her death. And now she never knew if it was a suicide or she was pushed, but she was definitely a grieving mother. And she really wanted some evidence that her, her daughter was around. So I kid you not, I'm, I'm sitting right next to this woman and I'm watching her picture develop. And what developed was now this woman, her face was narrow and her mouth was closed. And what developed was this rounded girl's face, totally different hairstyle, big smile, big cheeks, and a round face that developed kind of like this, this lady and the, the blonde lady. But, she, and then this woman pulled out a picture of her daughter and it was the same person. I mean, it was so cool to me. And then um, Sonia Rinaldi, you can see, she actually has bubble wrap in front of the picture or the image of the woman on the left. And then she films the bubble wrap with the lady behind it. And then you can see the different pictures of um, like how those people would materialize in the developing video. And she's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pictures. These were just quick and easy for me to get, but that's Sonia Rinaldi. And I know several of us here were at the symposium and we got to see her speak and saw some of her slides. And there's just, there's no doubt that there's so much technology on the other side and people are trying to get through. And, you know, I've got a big piece of bubble wrap upstairs and I haven't experimented myself, but you know, I'm going to. Anyways, top right, George Meek. He is deceased, but he is, um, I think he's the guy that, coined the, the phrase the instrumental trans communication and the picture on the right really looks like them doesn't it 
Well, let me tell you where this picture came from. This guy had a, um, and the guy goes by the name of Orion Silverstar. I don't know what his real name is, but that's what his uh, internet name is. But he had a bowl that almost looked like a dog's water bowl, and he filled it with water. And then he was turning it, and he had light shining on it, and he had a camera that was focused on it. And so that picture developed within the, the filming, and um, that's called the water light method. So I think that's pretty darn cool. So next, I'm going to go into spirit artists, because I love this. Now, Reverend Rita Berkowitz is over on the right, and she has had her own health concerns, so she's not practicing right now as a, um, a spirit artist. But for years and years and years, she has. And uh, the top pictures, um, yeah, from the guy in the beard up, are all drawings of hers. And they, she's not only someone who would... Um, draw a picture of your loved one, but she'd be giving you a meeting and reading at the same time. And I was really honored um, after about five months after my dad passed away, I saw her. And not only did she draw a nice picture of my dad, um, like what he looked like in the Air Force back in his 20s. Oh, speaking of which, we get to pick our best age, our best health, our best weight, <laughs> no physical ailments, kids grow up in the afterlife, and you're in perfect health. So, um, yeah, she drew a picture of my dad in his, in his early years, and that, that was great. But he, she also told me things that there's not a living soul alive that could tell me about my dad. My dad and I confided in some stuff before he took his last breaths, and they came right out of Reverend Rita's mouth, the conversation we had. She said he was whispering it into her, his, her ear, and that was great. And then Sandy Ingham down below, she's somebody I interviewed also. And these are some of her pictures. She's in the UK, and she's just awesome. Uh, I always rate my radio shows, which ones give me the most goosebumps. And the show with her, I don't remember what number it is, but um, I got goosebumps 18 times. That's how many times that I felt like, that's unbelievable. That's so wonderful. So spirit artists. And I know there's more out there that are doing this. So near-death experiences are fascinating because often – uh, and not all the time that, um, you know, we flatline or on an operating table or whatever that we can actually, people say they go to the light and they have a life review and so many different things. But Anita Morjani, if you haven't read her book or heard her story, she had stage four cancer, filled her body. They could no longer give her any more medication. Last rites were coming, you know, I mean, she was on her way out and she had a, not only a near death experience, but she was, um, whoever it was in the afterlife that, that spoke to her, made a, a deal with her, this is in my own words, that if she were able to heal and she was newly either married or engaged, but she'd have to talk about uh, the reality of the afterlife and that we are dis divine souls and, um, she made that agreement and she's a great speaker, but she is one of those proven miracles because from the moment she opened her eyes, the cancer disappeared from her system and she healed. And Dr. Nancy Rhines, who was a scientist, a former atheist, never believed in any of this stuff. And she got hit by a car, was actually dragged underneath the car, had an out of body experience, went to heaven. Uh, Dr. Raj Parti, I interviewed him. He was so honest. Talk about an ego. He drove a Hummer and a Mercedes, and he had something like a $10,000 a month um, house mortgage payment. It was all about the money, not about the people. And he had kind of a scary near-death experience, but when he focused on the light and like the love from God, it all changed. And uh, he was an anesthesiologist as a doctor, and he says and now instead of putting people to sleep, he wakes people up. So he's great. And uh, Dr. Raymond Moody obviously did a lot of work on the afterlife, near-death experiences, the research. And, you know, there's something that is out now saying that our brains uh, are, survive death by a couple of minutes or something like that after the body dies. And people are saying that that's the reason for near-death experiences. And I say it's a lot of hogwash because my friend Ken Ring he actually studied the near-death experiences of blind people who never had vision, and in the near-death experience, they floated above their body. They could see into into, uh, into the room. They could, you know, see what's happening, and they've never been able to see. And you tell me, how could they have vision for the first time and then accurately tell? 
And you know, our that inner critic of ours wants to, and I'm speaking for myself, if, if you know, we don't want to believe it. You know, it's, when it seems too good to be true, sometimes it is. But, you know, in the world of the afterlife, you know, we put in the research and the time listening and reading and all that. This stuff is true. The afterlife is real. So next I have on the list um, this trance mediumship. And the, this now we're getting into what I'm studying these days is I took a course in the Arthur Henry College about closing, you know, quieting our mind, which I think not only is a good thing to do when we're grieving, because it does help our neurotransmitters um, build, you know, that meditation people talk about, but it's also the access way that mediums use to connect with our loved ones. And so what trans mediumship is, is nobody takes over our body, nothing like that, not um, no poltergeist or anything, but our loved ones can merge their energy fields with ours. And in a case of my friend Mark Bedwood here, I met him on this course at Arthur Finley College. He had his eyes closed, and about 15 minutes later, a whole different voice spoke out of him with the words of the most beautiful wisdom about living life and what death is, uh, death being an illusion, and what our lives are for, and just beautiful. And it's not just Mark. There were 30 of us in the class, and um, we all did it to a certain extent. And it's really incredible to think that um, these beings that have once walked planet Earth can merge with us and, and, um, and talk. And it's not even just that, but you know people that, whether they're athletes or artists and they get in the zone, I think we all have people that are our angels or our guides and our helpers that can be with us and, um, and help us. On um, the top left, that's an example of trance writing. I've actually witnessed people with their eyes closed in the class I was in. They were writing, and it was uh, like the loved one's handwriting from someone who um, was passed away. And that was mind-blowing to me. Um, and the top right, why I included the picture from the movie Ghost, is if you remember the scene where Whoopi Goldberg actually stepped into, I mean, Patrick Swayze actually stepped into Whoopi Goldberg's body and spoke to his wife, Demi Moore. Um, I witnessed uh, you know, on this um, week at the Arthur Finley College, our teacher doing that. I mean, she had her eyes closed, she was in this trance-like state, and it was as if someone's um, husband, wife, parent stepped into her. And even though it was her voice, it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation they were having with uh, their loved one. And I. I think there's very few mediums that do that on planet Earth, but um, this college is trying to encourage mediums to build up their skill because I mean, to, I, I, there was not a dry eye in the house to witness this. You know, it, again, it might seem too good to be true, but I witnessed it. I witnessed it. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, hard to believe, but um, most beautiful thing, most beautiful thing to hear your loved one speak. On the bottom is a man named Jose Madrado, and I'm including him here because he goes into a trance, and within five minutes, or even ten minutes, see those paintings down beneath? He will paint them, and his story is that these deceased artists actually use his hands, and um, many times his eyes are closed, and he can do a piece of artwork like this, and he claims that it's Van Gogh and Monet and you know some of the masters, and then some of the little guys. But I took some time to research some of his um, paintings, and lo and behold, like, I don't remember who this artist is, but um, on the bottom left, but whoever had painted, actually painted in that style. And I thought, if that's possible, you know, what else is possible? And every dime that is made from him selling his artwork go to an orphanage in Brazil. So he's another one that does this all for free, all right? So um, I'm just going to include this because this is something that I wrote. I went into that trance state myself, and uh, I, you know, I was a little fearful. I didn't want to speak, but I said, if there's any words that want to come through me, I'm open. And so without me even thinking of these words, I, I simply typed out every word that came to my mind. And I just want to read this because I think it means a lot as to who we are as human beings. I was having a really lousy day and uh, I just, you know, my head was all over the place. And then this just came out. Silver are the seas and the moonlight bounces from one wave to the next. 
gently stirring and moving. The crests are but a moment in time that is quickly forgotten. Life for you and me is quite the same. Silvery, glittery, glistening moments of greatness are highlights and pleasantries, so wonderful, so joyful, illuminated by the moon as the beauty dances upon the shallow waves. Beneath the, beneath the water, the fish watch in wonder. They dance in delight. However, only the moon knows that a dramatic shift will soon occur. It is not known when it will happen. But as sure as the brightness of the day is replaced with the darkness of the night, so too will the seas become stormy. A great gale force arrives and wreaks havoc on the ocean waters. High tides and waves abound, crashing the thunderous storms on the waters. The peaks and the valleys are mighty. Danger looms for the ship on the water. Danger looms for all who fall entranced to the dark clouds and giant waves in our minds. The fish go deep to the bottom of the ocean where it is safe and peaceful. To those witnessing the surface of the water, the moon reflects a violent ocean. However, to the moon, it does not really matter. For millions of years, the moon sits quietly in its place and just observes. Be the moon, act as the fish, and go into the quiet stillness of your depths. Times will always change. Be confident of that. Remember the moon, and you will remember thyself. And so I literally typed this within a minute and a half as the words just showed up. I put them down, and then I read this, and I said, there's no way I wrote this. But did it help? Yes. Times will change, but if we can quiet our minds and know that this too will pass, and there will be better days. You know, I think that's really the message. So the last thing that I have, the last reason I say we can believe in the afterlife, even though there's more, is something what's called physical mediumship. And this to me is, the, as, is it completely outrageous and really battles my mind to think something like this could happen. But ah, I'm studying it now and I can't find a, <laughs> I, I'm thinking it's real. Um, and so there's terms like ectoplasm and seance and things I'm like embarrassed to say because I thought people are going to think I'm talking about Ghostbusters. But there's this place called Banyan Retreat Center in the UK. And even if you've been to the Afterlife Symposium, um, we talked about physical mediumship. And in the times of past, people would gather in small groups and in the dark and they'd invite their loved ones to come in and speak. And you know, I've seen that in horror movies, but didn't know that was real. But I've been this to this Banyan Retreat Center three times now. And in the case, like the medium, Scott Milligan, you see his picture, would sit in this cabinet. And there's a black curtain that goes across the, uh, to the front. And we were all sitting in this area here, all holding hands. Nobody's breaking the circle. The medium is actually tied to the chair for no reason other than to prove that he's not getting up and manipulating things and, and doing things um, as a hoax. But at one point, all of these Christmas presents that were here, uh, first time I went, there were many more presents. They got unwrapped by invisible, um, they said invisible children in the spirit world. And then there's toys that were inside them and the toys were all moving around. And how we knew that, not only could we hear it, but a lot of them had glow in the dark things. So I saw a hula hoop floating around in front of my eyes. There was a, uh, a, a drum that was being banged at the same time. There's a horn being blown and there's a piano being banged on. And as great as that was, and what was even more great, and I think this is the real purpose of, of this, is there were what seemed to be voices coming out of nowhere. And people's loved ones were talking to them through the veil through and having conversations um, that, you know, th this is something why it's important to me to keep studying this is if this is possible to bring this back in 2017 and teach people about this and get people experimenting, I think it, it's a great thing. Um, up on the top right, there's a gentleman by the name of Leslie Flint who, who again, would only give this away. And now I'm I'm not in the UK, but 35 pounds to me is not a lot of money. That's probably, I don't know, $42 or $45 in US money. But that's all it would cost at Banner Retreat to sit in on one of these seances, uh, which means meeting. Um, but to hear these voices come through, this guy Leslie Flint for 40 or 50 years 
uh, these voices were coming from his seances. And people on average would be 20 people that would come through a night that would talk to their loved ones. And there's lots of recordings. And it's like, again, my inner voice thinks like, how can I even share this with you? Because it sounds so outrageous. But folks, I really do believe there's a level of reality to this. And I've got to go on the search. I have to figure out if this is, if this is real. Um, I'm including Dan Aykroyd, who wrote Ghostbusters, because uh, you can see on the bottom left, David Thompson, who's going to be speaking at the next symposium. There's this stuff that is called ectoplasm. And this is gross to say, but it's some kind of a vaporous stuff that comes out of the medium. And then our loved one can actually step into it and... They can touch you, they can form a voice box, they can talk in their own voice, they can, and it, again, like I can't, I'm thinking all these people are going to think I'm crazy, but I've got to go in search of the truth, and found out from Dan Aykroyd, I didn't talk to him, but I've done some research, his grandfather and great-grandfather were spiritualists, meet, um, spiritualists. And they had these seances in their house. So Dan Aykroyd was very familiar with the term ectoplasm. That's why he used it in the movie Ghostbusters. And even though that's a comedy, uh, his dad wrote this book, A History of Ghosts. And I just, it just came to my house today. So I'm, that's the next thing I'm reading. But Dan Aykroyd and his dad believe in spiritualism. They believe in the afterlife. And he says, you know, I wrote Ghostbusters based on some of the things I knew about from a kid. I think it's fantastic. There's a book about this guy, Alec Harris, the full story of his remarkable physical mediumship by his wife. Now, he died many years ago, but the wife, they didn't even believe in this stuff. And then somebody dragged him to um, one of these seances. And next thing you know, he became one of the greatest mediums of all time. In fact, he only gave it away. He had another job, but people would come and their loved ones would come through this cabinet, um, sometimes there'd be a little right red light on and they'd actually see their loved one. Mothers were able to hold their children. You could hear their voices. Um, and these days, right now, everything's happening in the dark, which again, our inner voice says, oh, it can't be real if it's happening in the dark. But I tell you, I think there's hundreds of um, these groups around the world that are practicing this. And I think we can get the word out that um, there's a possibility to it and, and that we can experiment I think it's a really good thing so I'm gonna have to be a big girl and have a backbone and share and if you want to come to the Banyan Retreat Center with me it's an awesome place around every Easter and every Thanksgiving they they have um, a workshop a five-day workshop which is so loving and so great so anyways next um, we're I'm going over time am I still okay with my moderators you you're, still good. you're good yeah Okay, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, oh, these poor people, there's not any time for questions and answers. But I really want to give you everything I can, because I, I do think this is so important. Um, so I'm not going to read this whole thing about physical mediumship. But I'm just going to go to the bottom, because it's the most important and most unbelievable of all, materialization, solid forms of family and friends returning from the dead with their own personalities, their voices, and their love and witnessed by all. You know, there's been these things called apports that will drop uh, in the middle of the room. You know, there was actually a newspaper from the wartime, I think in the early 40s, that came into somebody's um, seance and it was in perfect condition. There's so many things. Okay, next picture is uh, this woman, Ann Harrison, on the bottom. Her husband wrote the book on the right, of Life After Death, The Living Proof. And she's also the one that uh, did the slideshow at Banyan. And that person on the right is her uh, husband's Aunt Aggie, who that's what an ectoplasmic person looks like. And although it might just look like a person wrapped in cloth, um, they swear that, that that was Aunt Ag who came through, and it came through in her own voice. You know, and I listening to this woman's stories, I'm thinking, she's not lying. <laughs> you know, this is not... Her trying to con me out of money to convince me. This is this is the real deal. Even the Stuart Alexander on the right, he was a physical medium for 50 years. He and his brother attended one of these seances and thought it was pretty cool. And lo and behold, suddenly weird stuff started happening, you know, um, through him. So he just gave the most incredible stories. And I included this Dan Aykroyd uh, YouTube video. Just what you can type in, Dan Aykroyd believes in ghosts on QTV. 
and it's a 20 minute uh, interview with him and his dad sitting there about what they witnessed. And, um, and you know, I tell you, it's as crazy as it sounds, you know, I, I think this is real. And then even Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, when he went to his first seance and uh, when he first get, started getting involved with this, he was so oh, just captured by it that he actually stopped writing any of the Sherlock Holmes stuff and spent the next over 40 years of his life studying spiritualism with scientists, going to these, uh, these kind of things and writing about it. And what happened was, I think back in the day, you know, especially with all the wars, so many people, there was so much death that as real as some of this probably was, there were so many con artists and frauds that would prey on grieving people that this kind of mediumship kind of disappeared. And then also, you know, we're in the world of technology. Um, this, our spirit friends, when this thing's happened, when people got together as families and they'd sing and you know all these great things would happen but now you know we're all sitting around on our iPhones <laughs> and and doing things on the computer so there's not so much of the camaraderie which laughter and song builds the best energy for our loved ones to come through so anyways that's why I included this and then I think oh yeah this is we're at the end here um, I love this quote by Carl Jung I shall not commit the fashionable stupidity of regarding everything I cannot explain as fraud. So how often is it that if we can't explain it, it can't be true? I got some message today on YouTube, and this guy who's followed all of my um, um, my radio shows, but he thinks I've really gone off on the deep on the deep end now, and he's not going to listen to me anymore. And it's like, well, okay, I get it, because how I was, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, I would have thought I was a lunatic too, but. You know, we're each on our own spiritual journey, which, which brings me to this next one. Um, I don't know if you've heard of this uh, serotonous pine cone, but there's a picture of it on the bottom left. And the only way this pine cone can actually uh, grow and produce a tree is if it is subjected to a really intense fire. So I say that grief has the power to destroy or transform us. The serotonous pine cone requires extreme heat from a mighty blaze to open. And our sincere wish for you is to allow your grief to set you on a journey of self-discovery, a journey where you'll know that you're, you are an eternal soul having a human experience, that your loved ones invisibly surround you and cheer you on, and that you are dearly loved. And I really think that that is what's happening and that, you know, that grief is a mighty blaze. But I tell you, that grief is what you brought you here to helping parents heal and being a part of this and you're on your own journey. And I'm sure many of you have felt this from time to time, but there is nothing that feels better than to help another human being. And I think that's one of the most important lessons that we can learn, even in helping our own selves through grief um, is, is to help another. And then these are just some resources that I thought you'd enjoy. Um, the AREI, which is closely uh, working with help, helping parents heal. Um, we have the yearly symposium, afterlifesymposium.org. Roberta, uh, Roberta Grimes, I think many of you might know her, but um, she's an attorney who hosts her own radio show and uh, has so much information on the afterlife, very credible. Victor and Wendy, Wendy Zamet are our friends, too, in Australia. Uh, they have the Friday Afterlife Report. It's loaded, chock full every week with good resources about the afterlife. This Arthur Finley College, if you want to make a trip to the UK, or you might already be in the UK listening to this, um, it really a good place to just tap into your own divinity, your, your own um, soul having a human experience. I love Bob Olson. He's a private investigator that's given his life to studying the afterlife. He's got Afterlife TV. Um, Banyan Retreat Center, just super. Um, Suzanne Wilson, I did this slideshow for the first time a couple of days ago, and so that's why she's on here. She knows so much, and she's got a great book called Soul Smart, um, which is so super because she really teaches people how you can get, you know, 
kind of open that relationship if you haven't had a message from your loved one or a sign. And one thing that I thought really came out of it that's important is, you know, I, I know for myself, I wanted like a bolt of lightning to come and say, dad is here. You know, I wanted something so vivid that some of these signs we get are very subtle and we have to be proactive, I think, a little bit. If we can set a time and maybe a couple of times a week or once a week, that even if you're sitting at your kitchen table and you put a empty cup on the other side and you just envision your loved one being there and start having a regular time that you're communicating with them and and ask for a sign ask okay can you step into my energy can i feel something and you might feel a tap on your hand you might feel the goosebumps you might feel love on your heart you might get a flash in your mind's eye of something you did together and these very subtle signs um, can be really healing for us and also I mean, if you can imagine your loved one on the other side is trying to move heaven and earth to get the message across, and I don't know how they learn it, but they're trying. So if we can work together with them and know that there's still a lot of And lastly, my main site, 200 and I don't know, 20 episodes, I think, so, so far, of really good conversations with people about the proof of the afterlife and then always leaving you and me with reasons to live a good life while we're here. Because I do believe that our life is important and that our life matters. And just a few gifts that I want to give you is um, if you go to my website and you sign up for the Insiders Club, which it says it's a club and that's my email list, but I don't send you too many emails at all. But I have a PDF file, which is the 19 reasons to believe in the afterlife, even though I have 10 here. These are the best 10. But I put live links, um, um, different episodes you can listen to and different things you can look at with even more information about this. And then I have my um, the How to Survive Grief audio, something too that will be sent right away to you. It actually opens up and you can play it. And then also it says receive the first few chapters of my book. But between you and me, it's the whole book. So you don't have to buy anything. But that's, that's that about that. And uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I'm going to stop my screen share right now. And then we'll get back to our moderators who are telling me where we're doing on time. Right. And uh, questions. How do I do? We're doing fine. You did great. Thanks, Sandra. That was, that was fantastic. That was amazing. We can go as long as... Oh, okay. I want to. It's, it's, I want to be it's, respectful because I know time is important if there's any questions. Yeah, um, we have a, actually we have a comment. Um, okay. Jenny wants to let you know that the way she was led to your book was that after her brother passed on last Christmas Eve, within a couple of days, she kept hearing in her head, we don't die. And I felt it was my brother sending me that message. So a few weeks later, continuing to hear we don't die, I attended a monthly meeting where we talk about the afterlife and share books. I was looking at the books and there it was, We Don't Die. And I knew my brother had sent your book and it brought me lots of peace. Wow. Thank you, Jenny. That's beautiful. Back into the message or just... Yeah, that's awesome. And it, but we have to pay attention because I think it's so easy. And you did to like when we hear things like, pay attention to that or if we see road signs or we keep getting these feelings pay, pay attention because again even though we are not in the afterlife we are still souls that have um this divine potential of being able to you know hear things psychically and all that so thank you so much jenny um i had a question for you, you said that, uh, a listener had written to you and said he thought you had gone off the deep end with some of the, the things you've yes. been talking about lately like like what because i've been listening well, to you for two years and i don't have that impression oh you're so wonderful well i just posted uh, a 10 minute sound clip when i went to banyan retreat the mil the uh, medium scott milligan mm -hmm. um went into trance and for an hour his guide eric spoke through him and it was a question and answer period where people could ask him questions. And he's a soul that is living in the hereafter. And he claims that he last walked on planet Earth at the end of the, the 1800s. And he speaks in like this old English accent. And if you knew Scott, it's totally a different person. And um, 
it's easy to think that the media must be putting this on. But I've heard him speak, I've heard Scott speak. Again, you know, I look at the price tag on things. When things are really cheap and there's this of love and there's this essence of helping the grieving, you know, I buy into it more than somebody who's charging $500 for five minutes. <laughs> and so um, I asked a question because I, my biggest complaint about being a human is suffering. And uh, after seeing dad die the way he did, I always thought the moment I take my last breath, that's the first question I have for God is why, why do we have so much suffering? Is, is there a purpose to suffering? And so when I had this opportunity to ask this uh, spirit that was speaking through Scott something, I was a little intimidated, but I thought, you know what? <laughs> I'm going to ask that question. And what came was a really great answer about um, uh, suffering being a byproduct of being human. And it was, it's really well said about love and life. And uh, I think this gentleman just felt that, you know, here I am trying to, you know, bring in uh, dead voices. I, I was losing my mind. But, I, you know, you got to listen, listen, I say, because um, if something resonates as the truth, which to me, the answer totally did. Uh, and, and again, I've seen Scott speak a lot of times. He's not about the money. Mm -hmm. and, um, anyways, that's, that's what I think, Brian. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just curious what it was. Um, are you going to do an episode about your trip to, to Banyan? I am. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. It's a lot of the things I've discussed before, but just with new eyes. Uh, you know what I can tell you that I haven't told anybody yet is that the lights were out and again, there was some glow in this dark stuff happening. Um, but I knew everybody in the room. So I just didn't get it that somebody's manipulating. But what happened was there was a very small, about the size of a, uh, like a tablet, you know, um, and it was glow in the dark and I can hear people going, Oh my God, oh my God. I'm thinking, what are they seeing? Well, it looked like this tablet was going to float past me but it was two little hands it must have been like a four-year-old child and the mm. fingers were moving and there was he was holding on to this glow in the dark thing and i felt a little tug on my leg and i thought there is no child present in this room there's no way a human being could have artificially you know created like a like a real alive moving child's hands and to see that it's you know because my mind can't find a way for that to be possible. But then when I read these books and I hear these stories, I'm thinking, God, if this could be replicated and we in 2017 and beyond can start having our loved ones have their voices again, I don't think there's anything that will be more healing than that. But again, you know, there's plenty of fraudulent people out there that do prey on the grieving. So... I'm interested in it. And I, my mom told me once, if I try to make everybody happy, I'm not going to make nobody happy. So I'm going to follow what's in my heart. And I say that to everybody. If something that I've said or somebody else said really interests you and you do some research and it gives you life, which my, everything here has happened ever since my dad passed. And uh, it really has given me life. And it's, it feels so good to be able to serve and, and have miraculous things happen. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Anybody else have any other questions? Um, I just wanted to give an endorsement for, for Sandra. I, I found uh, We Don't Die. I think it was the first podcast I found after, after Shana passed. It was in June of 2015. And I've listened to every episode. And it's, it's got me through that first summer for sure. Um, and I like the fact that you do investigate all different types of areas of evidence. And like we, you, I can't go to Banyan, so I feel like I went to Banyan through you. So yes. I'm just sharing that. And you know what, Banyan's coming to you because if if you go back to the symposium, um, ninety nine percent sure Scott Milligan's going to be there and David Thompson's going to be there. Now I don't think they're going to be doing seances for a group of a thousand people, but right. to talk about their experiences and even you know both of them being able to go in the trance state and. Uh, Oh, we saw Suzanne Giesman do it. There's, it's just so inspiring. So. Yeah, well, a, a bunch of us were at the symposium in Scottsdale. Um, actually, what was it, 10 of us, Tracy? 12 of us? Yeah, there was. Yeah, we were the 
what they called the happy group. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, I want to also say I've listened to every one of yours and they're so inspiring and so helpful and you make it sound fun and you're always so upbeat and I think it would help our parents a lot and I want to thank you for everything you do to encourage our parents because you know giving back you're giving back and that's an amazing gift thank you very much you're welcome and I don't always understand it and I have plenty of dark times as well but I know from my own past that some really lousy stuff has happened in my life. And then I look to where I am now, and then I see like, oh gosh, if that hadn't happened that way, I wouldn't be where I am right now doing what I'm doing. And I, and I know that grief is horrendously painful, um, but I do think, and I, I don't even know if it's the truth or it's, I'm just telling you it's my truth because it's what empowers me. If I can look at my life and say, I might not understand why I'm going through what I'm going through, but if I can trust that I'm part of a bigger purpose and that <clears throat> I do believe in God, that there's a bigger purpose for me and there's service to be done and that I signed up for it, my soul signed up for it, that there'll be some day in the future that I'm able to look back and say, Ah, that's why it happened. And I, and I do believe that everything will <clears throat> sort itself out with my siblings when the time is right. But to be honest, had they behaved any differently and I had still close relationships with them, I would have never set sail on the journey that I'm on. So maybe they signed up to play their roles, you know, but I know beyond a shadow of a doubt when we close our eyes this last time on planet earth and we open them again, all of our loved ones will be there, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your pets, and um, it'll be a reunion. And, but for the time that we're here, we got to give it our all, uh, go through the discomfort, learn, serve, make a difference wherever we can really get our money's worth out of this, this lifetime. And, um, because, you know, if there is reincarnation, I don't want to have to do some of this all over again. I don't. So, and then That's they really good say, advice. Too, one last thing is that um, the common denominator out of all these near-death experiences is that people have this life review. And they say it's not like somebody's judging you, but you're actually looking at your own life. But you feel the impact that your actions have on another person. So if you've hurt another, hurt another person, you actually will feel their pain, the pain that you caused them. But the flip side of that is then after you witness all of that, you actually see the good that you did in the world and you see the ripple effect that your actions had. And so there are moments that, you know, whether I want to lie to my mother or something like that, I think, ah, but if I have to revisit this, I don't really want to feel what she's feeling. So let me just do the right thing. But just know that every good deed is, is recorded. And um, yeah, if you can make, even with just a smile, make somebody else's day brighter, even if you're having a lousy day, it'll make a difference. Thanks, thanks, Scott. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That uh, I, we really appreciate you you being here for us, and, and especially this busy time of year. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, we will have parents that will watch us in the next coming weeks, months. Um, and we wanted to really, you know, we wanted to do this because this is a tough time of year for a lot of people. Uh, so we really appreciate you taking time out to do this. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. It was really good. Well, if anybody wants that slideshow. Or I also have an audio called Reconnections. Um, I can find either you can email me, Sandra Champlain at gmail.com, or I can send that to you guys and you can post that with this video. Would that be all right? Yeah, if you want to uh, if you want to email that to me, I can post okay. it in files on our group. Um, yeah, so I'll, send, my, I'll send you an email. My reconnections audio is something where you close your eyes and for 20 minutes you let me guide you to clearing your mind into a safe space where you can invite in your loved one. And okay. your mind might want to say this isn't real, but there's been some pretty darn magical things that have happened. And so you, I want to get to that as well. You know, Sandra, you don't talk much on your radio show about all of your gifts and all, and the things you've done. You more talk, will obviously talk with your guests. Yeah, I think I have throughout them, but then, you know, I'm always about service and wanting to share other people and yeah. 
I've got my own inner voice that says, shut up, Sandra, let the guests talk. <laughs> but I can do some more of that. That would be awesome. I really appreciate your show. I, I, I'm, I'm excited every time I see a new episode download, I can download it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, me too. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yep. I think uh, we're out of questions. Sandra, I, we're going to respect your time as well because I know you're a busy person. Um, so we're going to say good night. I'm going to mute, unmute everyone. Uh, it'll get loud in here, but everyone will say thank you to you. Uh, again, we appreciate you being with us. You are welcome. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're amazing. Thank you. So are you. Oh, wow. Thanks one to no one. This is what we're all about. All right. Uh, Jason, and we'll see you at the symposium. If not sooner. Yeah, hopefully yeah. sooner, but if not. Okay. I want to go to Banyan with you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Are you going back to Banyan in the spring? I sure am. I'm going to do every one that I can. Well, Thanksgiving, because we do, we we have our conference in the, around Easter. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But I was thinking next Thanksgiving. <laughs> I love it. And I'm going to bring them to the United States. I really think that I've got a big enough mouth, enough credibility that I can at least, you know, join anybody who's interested. And if you're not, you're not. That's fine. But, uh, Together we are mighty. And That's very, right. Absolutely. This afterlife is the truth. It is real. And we need to get, to get it to people. <clears throat> All right, guys. Thank Good you night. so much. Thank you, Brian.